Welcome to Stroke Buddies Tuesday Stroke Survivor Support Group meeting. If you're watching this on YouTube, you're welcome to join us um, every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, we're in the process of switching from talking about subjects to having presentations on various subjects and our presenter today, Joe McCullough, also presented last week. I have to thank Joe seriously for stepping up to the plate during this transition and carrying the load two weeks in a row. Got a couple of more things lined up in the future, including a presentation or a talk on uh, attitude and the importance of positive affirmations, and also have a physician, a doctor who had a stroke, who's willing to talk uh, about her uh, story and uh, what it's like from both sides of the bed. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Joe McCullough. Thank you so much. I just shared my screen. Can you see it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, well, last week we talked about ants, automatic negative thoughts, but I think it's more important that we understand, and not, not only us that live through a stroke, but a lot of people that might be watching this on YouTube, of what a stroke really, what really is. Um, so I put together this short YouTube, I mean, this short PowerPoint presentation on the anatomy of a stroke. I've also been working on another one that I was sharing with Ralph on um, a little bit more detailed about how the brain works. Yeah. But without further ado, here we go. And I'll start it. Anatomy of a stroke by and for stroke survivors. There are three types of strokes, ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, and transient ischemic attack. Ischemic strokes. Ischemic strokes occur when a vessel supplying blood to the brain is obstructed. It accounts for about 80% of all strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes results from a weakened vessel that ruptures and bleeds into the surrounding brain. Hemorrhagic strokes make up about 13% of strokes. Transient ischemic attack, often called a warning stroke. These occur when a blood clot blocks an artery for a short time. The only difference between a TIA is that with a TIA, the blockage is transient or temporary. TIA symptoms occur rapidly and last a relatively short time. Unlike a stroke, when a TIA is over, there's no permanent injury to the brain. There is no way to tell if symptoms of a stroke will lead to a TIA or a major stroke. Effects of a stroke. The brain is an extremely complex organ that controls various body functions. If a stroke occurs and blood flow can't reach the region that controls a particular body function, that part of the body won't work as it should. Who is at risk for a stroke? Risk factors for stroke can be changed, treated or medically managed. High blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, smoking, birth control pills, history of TIAs. A high red blood cell count, high blood cholesterol and lipids, lack of exercise or obesity, excessive alcohol use, illegal drugs, abnormal heart rhythms, cardiac structural abnormalities, risk factors that cannot be changed, old age, race, and gender. Although there are only three types of strokes, the long-term effect of a stroke can be vastly different depending on where the stroke occurred. Example, a left right hand stroke. Right brain's functions are typically art awareness, creativity, imagination, intuition, insight, holistic thought, music awareness, 3D forms, and control of the left hand of the body. Left brain stroke functions are analytic thought, logic, language, reasoning, science and math, written, number of skills, and movement of the right hand of the body. 
Breaking it down even further, the brain is like a 3D jigsaw puzzle. Each part or area controlling a different function, and often each area working in conjunction with another area. The cerebral cortex is part of the brain that makes human beings unique. The functions that originate in the cerebral cortex include consciousness, higher order thinking, imagination, information processing, language, memory, perception, reasoning, sensation, voluntary physical action. The cerebral cortex can be divided into four sections, which are known as lobes. The frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is associated with reasoning, motor skills, higher level cognition, and expressive language. The parietal lobe. The parietal lobe is associated with tactile sensory information, such as pressure, touch, and pain. Temporal lobe. Interpreting sounds and language memory, speech perception, and language skills. Occitable lobe, interpreting visual stimuli and information. The midbrain, it acts as sort of a relay station for auditory and visual information. The medulla controls many vital automatic functions such as heart rate, breathing, and blood pressure. The pons. The pons connects the cerebral cortex to the medulla. The cerebellum. It receives information from the balance system. It is also associated with motor movement and control, but this is not because motor commands originate here. Instead, the cerebellum serves to modify these signals and makes motor movement accurate and useful. This allows different muscle groups in the body to act together and produce coordinated fluid movement. The cerebellum is also important in certain cognitive functions, including speech. The cerebellum makes up about 10% of the brain's total size, but it counts for more than 50% of the total number of neurons located in the entire brain. The hypothalamus, the umbilicabla, the thalamus, and the hippocampus. Medical science has mapped the brain to even finer details as to what part of the brain controls your every function. This particular diagram is the right side only. Wherever your stroke happened in your brain, there is permanent brain damage. It will be directly correlated with the mental and physical struggles you will experience. Your struggles could be anything under the sun. Vision, hearing, movement, ability to reason, speak, comprehend, remember, focus. You name it, it can be an issue going forward. Even for the moderator trying to read this PowerPoint presentation. Therefore, you should become your own advocate. Understand where your stroke occurred and what part of the brain was damaged. Know the functions of what was damaged. Share this information with your therapists, CNAs, nurses, your families and friends, and most importantly, anyone who is a caregiver. Do not assume they know. Recovery from a stroke is a very complicated ordeal. There is no recovery timeline. You will recover in your own time and to what extent science cannot predict. Yeah, I, I would like to have the people that have had a stroke um, sort of share with us what their stroke was and how it has affected them. So if I could ask Dennis, what type of stroke did you have? If you could turn on your turn on your microphone, Dennis. I had a right side ischemic stroke. So, you know, as you indicated, the left side of my body has paralysis. And uh, that's, that's my biggest uh, Achilles heel is I have no use of my, my uh, left arm or hand. You know, my balance is, is hit or miss. Some days is better than others. But I had no problems with my my speech. You know, that nothing that a couple of weeks of speech therapy couldn't fine tune. And cognitively, the doctors tell me I'm smarter than I was before the stroke. So I have to believe them. <laughs> so that's what I got. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dennis. Uh, Chris, what type of stroke did you have? 
I had a hemorrhagic stroke of the uh, basal ganglia on the right hand side, uh, which has obviously impacted on my left side. My my um, biggest biggest challenge, I suppose, is, is walking. Um, I can walk, but it's just just not improving. So um, I also have a problem with the arm, but uh, at least I can I can do some things, you know. But um, so it's impacted because I I also got um, dystonia as a result of the basal ganglia uh, stroke which is uh, means spasticity comes in. So I have good days and bad days. Yesterday, I, I played three hours of lawn bowls. And today I'm completely shot. You know, I, I, hard, I can hardly walk. So um, you, you'd think I'd improve over, over the over time, but it doesn't seem to work that way. Ralph, how about you? Um, I had a right side hemorrhagic stroke from due to high blood pressure that I was trying to manage naturally. And uh, I thought I was. I actually had a stroke. My blood pressure averaged, oh, at 140 over 90 or just slightly above that, uh, where it turns to the red zone. So I kind of preach to people to pay strict attention to blood pressure. It doesn't have to be 240 over 160 for you to have a for you to blow up because my brain blew up and so I'm left side affected um, what's my biggest challenge well in my recovery my biggest challenge was my shoulder my I got to walking um, fairly quickly um, I also multiplied out a bunch of bad habits and kind of started over with walking a few months in and my uh, hand and arm were backwards from the textbooks that don't, the, from what the textbooks say, which they say it moves from the gross, from your shoulder to your elbow, to your wrist, to your hand, to the, from the gross to the finer motor skills. Well, mine went exactly backwards from that. I was moving my fingers uh, within a few, within a month or so, and pretty decently also within three, three to six months, but my shoulder took over a year. Um, cognitively, I didn't really have any uh, issues. Language, I didn't have any issues either because I had a right side stroke and the was on the left side of the brain. Joe Carter, if I could ask you to uh, unmute your microphone and tell us what happened with you. I had um, two ischemic strokes. They're both on the right hand side, um, the meaning left side affected. Um, I pretty quickly, as Ralph said, I was up and running walk wise. Um, I carry a cane once in a while. Well, outside, just to be safe, um, I walk without a cane around the house. Um, cognitively, I still am a bit slow on some things, quicker on others. I, I understand that it's a right-sided stroke. I feel that I feel a little bit of a speech problem where I can't get the words out. Um, Um, how do I put this? Made gains that I am happy with, but I want more just like all of us do. Um, how do we try to find the right words to say this? Um, I want to get more and more, not so much functionality, but my biggest problem is my cognition, my thought processes, they're just, oh, how do I put it, uh, very hard for me to overcome them. I just had um, cataract surgery done on my right hand side. Or, yeah, my right hand side. Um, it's kind of weird. I think uh, there are sometimes when I look, I have both eyes, they kind of help each other. 
but like if I close my left eye, it seems like I can't see out of my right eye, but then when I make my patience about it, I see things clearer, but as if they're in a fog. Like I'm not paying. I guess my mind's just not, how do I put this connecting as it should? My eye seems to be working fine according to my eye doctor. Um, I'm sorry to have spoken out too much, guys. But like I said, it's sometimes a pain. Thanks so much. Well, Joe, you can never speak too much when you're talking about what you've gone through. So thank you so much for your sharing. And thanks, everybody, for sharing. I guess I'll share a little bit of what happened with me. My blood pressure was 228 over 182 when I had my stroke. I went to the hospital, and um, I had a hemorrhagic stroke in my cerebellum. And a cerebellum stroke does not have the same symptoms of what a regular stroke has, so they sent me home. And then I went back to the hospital three hours later, and I passed out at the admittance table, and I woke up 40 days later. Um, I spent the next four months with double vision. I threw up every day for the next seven months. I had, uh, and I was on a feeding tube for 10 months, and I spent 13 months in a nursing home. Um, my problem was with the cerebellum, of course, I lost my equilibrium. So I was seasick for seven months, and I, that's why I threw up every time I moved. So I sat as still as I could. And of course, sitting as still as you can, I ended up having total spasticity in my entire upper body. But after seven months, I started feeling better. I could sit up uh, a little bit, and then I could just, you know, I pushed myself a little bit every, as much as I could. Um, and after 13 months, I got out of the nursing home. I spent a year with my son. Um, but I'm pretty happy because none of my movement has ever been affected. Now, I have found out trying to do these videos that my speech is terribly is terribly. Um, affected. I stutter a lot, uh, and I have trouble with words, and uh, I still have trouble with uh, my equilibrium. I'm, if I turn too fast, I'm dizzy. Why well, dizzy every time I stand up? And uh, I can't. My focus is very slow. So between the vertigo slash dizziness and the slow focus, I can't drive but I can do about anything else. So I think I'm extremely fortunate and I'm extremely happy. I'm happy to be here and sharing with you. Um, you know, going forward, I've done another slide that I started with Ralph and I went into uh, the neural pathways that we have and then the, the neuroplasticity, the repairing of, of your neural pathways. And then of course, neural fatigue. So maybe that'll be coming up soon or a little bit later. It was interesting. One thing I noticed was um, uh, all four of us who described our strokes all had right side strokes and mm. uh, mostly uh, hemorrhagic. And th those are both, uh, uh, they're more ischemic, 87 to 13, and they're more uh, left about 80, or 80, 20 or somewhere around there. So if you have a right side hemorrhagic, um, and I know Dennis had a right side ischemic, but, um, you know, that's a rare stroke. The most common one, I guess, is a left side, uh, ischemic that that's 80% of, of both. Um, so, um, I guess, um, I could talk a little bit about, um, you see the D there, that's uh, for Dawn or Stormy. I kind of coach uh, uh, Stormy and she had a cerebral stroke and had some similar um, symptoms to, to you, uh, Joe. Um, I'm gonna ask her later, next time we talk one-on-one -on -one about um, throwing up and stuff. Her biggest issue is um, core strength, trunk strength, um, 
Hope you don't mind me talking about you, Stormy. Um, anyway, uh, cerebral strokes are tough. I worked with um, a gal for five years who had one, and it's real difficult because it's the part of the brain that puts the two sets of instructions together. Like it said in Joe's presentation, it'll, it takes those two sides and um, determines what the, the balance is. And uh, I think the word in the presentation was it allows for uh, fluid movement. You know, there are a couple of things in the presentation that um, that weren't in the presentation. You know, there might be people out there saying, well, I had an AVM. Well, uh, I'll uh, arterial venous malformation, but it's basically, uh, uh, it's different than a hemorrhagic stroke where I blew up. Um, it's a weakness in the blood vessels. So there are a number of other types of, not types of strokes, but places where the um, stroke can hit or ways that it hit. But an AVM is essentially a hemorrhagic stroke because um, it's a bleed. And the two ways that it happened, the stroke happens is, um, I didn't know this prior to mine, but uh, until I asked my neurologist, because I said, so I bled into my brain and it's not working, what's going to happen? And he said, um, well, that part of your brain is dead. He said, uh, I found out that blood is toxic to the brain. The brain needs more blood than anything else in the body. And that's why we've got these, you know, giant supply systems. And, um, but if it escapes from the capillaries that, uh, that run through the brain and supply the brain with oxygen and moves into the brain, it's toxic to the brain. And, uh, I asked if it would, what would happen there, if it would reach, if those cells or that area would regenerate. And he said, no, those cells are dead and gone. They'll, your body will flush them out. And, uh, I guess something else is in that space. Not quite sure what, so I won't try and, and guess. Um, and then ischemic strokes is the same sort of thing. Uh, when you have uh, when you have blood damage in area, it's not getting oxygen, obviously. And an ischemic is a, a, a caused by clots, and um, so it's shutting off the oxygen supply. If you have had an ischemic stroke, I would highly recommend that you. Uh, um, find out the source of your clots. They come from a lot of things. Um, AFib, another thing in, uh, is, uh, what's it called? The hole in your heart, where a lot of people, 10% or something like that, or people are born with a hole in their heart, and most people, it doesn't affect them. Um, people who have that, I've seen uh, most everyone who's ever had the uh, uh, operation to close it reports that it was successful. Anyway, you need to find out the cause of your stroke, regardless of whether it was a uh, hemorrhagic or ischemic. And if it was ischemic, you know, find out what caused the clots and try and fix it. Because the first thing that you want to do is not have another one. Um, you know, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to work six months on recovery and then lose it all having another stroke. So um, finding out the cause and getting to the root source and trying to fix the problem is really a, a key thing in, in moving forward. So. Very true. Find out what the cause is and what, how you can prevent another one either through medication or diet and exercise, most likely a combination of all three. Um, you know, it'd be nice to change your lifestyle before you had a stroke, of course, because a stroke will definitely change your lifestyle. Yeah. Um, but Joe, uh, so Joe, did you, uh, did you get rid of your spasticity in your upper body? Yes, I did. Um, I read about it and I figured out what it was and I knew what it was. And I would 
stretch my fingers as much as I could. And when I was able to get onto my side and get my arm up over my shoulder, I would get onto my side and put my arm up over my shoulder and I would lay there for three hours and just stretch the heck out of it. Yeah. And then I'd go to the other side. And um, I always look at, okay, what was the cause? The cause was not moving. The cause was tightening up. I'm not a doctor, but I figured, okay, I do the opposite. I stretch it and I got rid of it. Um, it took a while, but I got rid of it. I mean, it was a year later and I can only get my arm up to here. I remember trying to go through a the airport metal detector and I had to go to a special metal detector and he said, raise your arm. And I did this and he said, no, no, raise. I said, I can't. And finally he pushed it up further and got it raised. But uh, no, it's getting rid of spasticity is awfully difficult and it's awfully painful. But the way I looked at it, I just had to endure the pain. Chris, can you talk a little bit about dystonia for those folks that aren't real familiar with it? You said it was a result of your stroke? The result of whose stroke? Chris, I thought I said. Okay, sorry. So, sorry, um, I didn't hear you properly, um, Ralph. What? Sorry, I didn't hear you properly, Ralph. What oh, did you say? Okay. I was asking you to talk. Um, my audio is a little low, apparently. I have to look into that, so I'll talk loud. I was asking you for people who might be watching this um, to talk a little bit about dystonia. I have an idea of what it is, but you probably know. Uh, yes, it, it, it's um, another neurological condition. It's probably related to my basal ganglia stroke and um, not many people seem to know much about it to be honest uh, you, you can't find any any useful uh, thing on on the internet or or, or indeed talking to neurologists um, but it, the net effect is it causes um, uh, it causes spasticity some people with um, neck spasticity walk around with their neck complete, completely on the side like that so at least I haven't got that. But um, in my case, it just um, it, on my effective side, it, it just the muscles just tighten up. And uh, both your arm and your leg, all the way. Yep. Uh, more more so with my uh, my glutes and my and my upper leg. That's interesting. Those are the grossest mu uh, muscles you have on your entire uh, uh, side. Um, yeah. Um, have you tried to notice? I'm always trying to, like Joe, I'm always trying to figure this stuff out. So if I had it, I'd be trying to see what kinds of things, when it came on, and if anything I was doing brought it on. I know that uh, uh, playing, um, you call it, French call it bulls, you call it, uh, a, we call it lawn bowling. What is it in England? A lawn bowl bowling is what I do. Yeah, it's um. I, I know it's um how much you love it's probably totally worth it to you to be stove up the next day to get to do it. Um, in, but, in fact, I I, I create a, a walking frame with wheels on it, and, and and funny enough, I can walk up and down the bowl screen with that with my hands simply on the on the resting on, on this uh, frame and I walk fairly well but as soon as I take my hand off it um, so I'm, I'm guessing that um, my walking ability is there but it's just not um, I, I guess Lorraine will probably know more about this sort of thing well um, part of it part of it I find is and maybe not in your case but uh, fear plays a big factor all the time you know when you take that's why someone can walk better if they put one finger on your shoulder because it, for some reason um, alleviates the, the fear. And for those of you who didn't see Chris's post, he took what we would call in the States a standard bowling walker. Usually has two wheels and uh, people put two tennis balls sometimes on the other uh, two legs. Uh, Chris, I believe you mounted four larger tires or wheels uh, onto yours, and I think you had to do it because the 
Green Master was giving you a hard Oh, yeah. He's very, uh, you got a perfect green. He didn't want it to interfere with. Well, you know, you can't, can't, can't blame, can't blame him. him. They spend a lot of time. I thought that was a very um, innovative um, solution. Something that, you know, when I saw it, I went, oh, that's something I'd do. Because hmm. I'm always monkeying around with sticking sandbags on a roll of t rollator so you can't turn it over and that kind of thing. There are a lot of simple adaptions that we can do to things to make our lives easier, but that's a whole other subject and one we should do. Is if, I'm on, if I'm on a street uh, walking on, on the, on the uh, sidewalk, I would um, use a walking trolley, uh, a shopping trolley. And uh, I, just by simply having my hand on the on the shopping trolley is uh, enough to make me walk properly. Right. I preach about shopping carts because they're absolutely the best walkers out there as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And that one day I tried to kick my shins I tried to walk faster and throw my legs far forward as far as I could and see if I could accidentally, or well, in this case, on purpose, hit my shins on the um, bottom, uh, there's usually a bottom shelf. I couldn't do it. As long as I kept my arms out, um, couldn't do it. Because um, I recommend it a lot. I actually take people, I haven't been doing a lot since the pandemic in person kind of stuff, but I've taken three stark survivors shopping with me. I pick them up and I take them shopping at Home Depot or the grocery store. And I just tell them to either walk up and down or in the case of Home Depot or a, it's a big box store, Chris, a uh, home improvement store. I'll cool. tell them I'm going over to lumber, meet me over there. And then uh, when they get there, I'm done with, got my lumber. And I'll say, okay, now we're going to hardware. And I go over and they, they play catch up. It's interesting because I did that myself one time with my brother-in-law. He asked me if I was going to sit in the car, if I wanted to come in with him. And I had an aha moment. I realized, why well, sit in the car? Um, you know, it's a chance for therapy. So I went in and he did that to me. He said, okay, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go over there. So I, I uh, adopted it. Yeah. If I could add a, add a couple things to you, Ralph. Sure. When I go shopping... And usually I go with somebody because they have to drive me, of course. I always take the cart because that's my walker. Right. And it's amazing how much easier it is for me to walk with a shopping cart or a walker. Mm -hmm. And the same time, if I go on an airplane ride, I take a walker. Number one, it's just easier to do. I have to work less at it. And number two... I love it because it gives me space. People see a person with a walker, they naturally give you more space. And with my visual impairment, I like that space because otherwise people will just cut you off and crowd you and walk in front of your, your walkway. So I highly recommend a walker, even if you don't need one, I highly recommend one if you're in a crowded area. Um, because it really, really does help, and it really does make your life easier. When you talk about lawn bowling, I don't think I could ever do it, because when I try to play catch with the dog, I try to throw the ball, because my stroke was in my cerebellum, and the cerebellum controls your fine motor movement, I don't know when to let go of the ball. So sometimes I'll throw it, 10 yards in front of me, sometimes I'll throw it right in the ground, and there's been many a times where I throw it right up over my head, and I release the ball back here, mm -hmm. because I don't have, but I keep on doing that because the repetitive, the sustained repetitive action helps improve it. So my dog's lucky because I throw the ball to him a lot. 